certainly for the th for the clearing of the of the dials. It was all it was for. The numbers were all entered directly. When you press the key down, it turned the gears and entered the numbers and so on and so forth. And they added incremental. Um, in, the, in the very earliest models, the very earliest models, they, um, the carry mechanism wouldn't allow you to do multiplications like you know, you could do this and then move over, do one more, and move over and do another one. That would be that would be the way you would multiply. But the earliest models couldn't do that. It wasn't until 1904 that they he introduced a model that would do that. Anyway, um, around 1914, this model came out, and it has this red button on it, and it is a rather exotic feature that allowed allowed errors to be detected and corrected, which is very important. Um, let, let me put this in scope. This is obviously not a, a personal adding machine. This was not a personal adding This was a business adding machine. And the business that it, the, the, the um, need it addressed was back office data processing. Now another fellow right around Dorfeld's time was a fellow by the name of Howarth that most people remember will remember much more than they remember to our film. And he invented a, a machine to do similar work, to do back office data processing work. And uh, for the next 50 years, essentially, uh, Dorfelt's comptometers and IBM's tabulators, that later Howard Rith evolved into IBM, uh, were roughly equal competitors for that business. Uh, Dorfell had to establish schools to train these operators. Operators typically ran these like touch typists did. They never looked at the keyboard. They looked at the listings that they were entering in, and they would have 50 or 100 items in the listing, and the total had to come out right. So they had to be very highly trained operators. And uh, the customers couldn't train these people, so he saw, set up schools. And this was a worldwide school system. At one time, it was the largest private school system in the world. And he made money off that as well. But um, what happened, of course, well, why does nobody ever re <laughs> remember about any of this stuff? Well. Uh, this went on into, they were a successful company, it went on into the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and about in the 50s, both the tabulator and the comptometer and its, his operator, which made the system there, um, both fell victim to, guess what, mm -hmm. the computer. <clears throat> the mainframes came in and just wiped them all out within about 10 years. They lost 90% of the business, both of them, habulators and compounders. And, and Brooke, you mentioned that because Felt and Tarrant uh, paid dividends on their stock, they didn't have any money left for investment? Yeah, that was the other thing. It was a private company all along, and uh, Tarrant owned 50% of the stock and did nothing for it. And uh, the, the descendants of both Felt and Tarrant were essentially living off the dividends and living high off the dividends in the depression when everybody else was groveling and um, i've never quite forgiven them for that and at, while that was going on ibm was holding on to their money so come after the war and the relay computer turns into an electronic computer thanks to Markley and uh, what's his, what's his eckert. name eckert right up in philadelphia um, and the, the computer starts to be a real thing, even though the man that was in charge of Felton Tarrant sort of recognized the importance of this and tried to do something about it. He simply didn't have the money. He gave $250,000 to Illinois Institute of Technology, which was his alma mater, to develop an, an electronic computer. And they worked on it, and they did well. The trouble was, it was with vacuum tubes. And about the time they finished it, it became clear that that wasn't the way it was going to go. They didn't have any money to redo the engineering and so forth. 
And all in all, they, they really fell out. They would have been a good competitor. They didn't have quite the technology that IBM had because tabulators are always electromechanical. So they were always something you plugged into the wall. You don't plug these in, or you did plug that in. That was a motor-driven machine, but it really wasn't necessary. Uh, but a tabulator had to be plugged into the wall. So, so their technology was there, but that was never the key element anyway. Lots of people had technology to make computers in those days, as we all know. The real key was marketing. And Fountain Tark had entry to all these big companies, all but the very biggest companies uh, these, these computers were in. I mean, these, these computers were in. So when the computer market opened up, they could have been a viable competitor for IBM, but they just didn't have the money. And perhaps not quite the vision. So, Brooke, maybe uh, give us a quick um, quick demo of how these work. Oh, okay. Is that a, that'll be good for the for the I guess you understand too. that they're all key-driven, and none of them had a listing device on them. It was the thing about it was, you know, they worked the way I, I said that they would all win. All right, so uh, as you okay, as you press down, nothing happens on these. I don't know if you know. Well, you can't can't notice it from that. But anyway, when you when you press down, the zero does not change. It changes when you release it. Now, the reason that was important was because for multiplication, if you, and the way you multiply is you put in one value with your fingers and you hit the number of keys with the, let's say the three is the far right of the multiplier, and then you shift over, and let's say two was the next one, you shift it over again, and say seven was the next one. And then you, you would get the answer. Now the reason that worked was because by waiting until all the keys were down to record anything in the registers, he could then, the, mecha the mechanics underneath here would control all the carries and they will all go at the same time. If you didn't do that, if you didn't get your carries all your ducks in a row, you just, were, you just weren't going to have the right answer. And as I say, it was, it was the A model in 1904, introduced in 1904, that, that allowed that to happen. Before that, he he was only moderately successful. And, and the handle is just a clearing mechanism. The right? handle is the clearing mechanism. It's the only thing it's used for. And uh, in 1912, Burroughs and uh, w William Burroughs invented his adding machine, mm -hmm. which is essentially a listing machine, right about the time that Dorfelt invented this machine. <clears throat> and it's my s s um, conviction that his partner, Tarrant, convinced him that he should make a machine with a listing device on it. And that they called that the Comptograph, because graphing, you know, printing, and so on and so forth. And Dorfelt worked on that for about 15 years and never was able to bring off a machine that could compete with the Burroughs adding machine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because he, the, the mechanism, the concept in here just didn't lend itself to, to adding on a listing device. It just didn't make any sense. In the first place, you had to put them all in and then mm -hmm. you had to crank it in order to get the, the printing. In other words, the key driven wasn't going to wasn't going to list anything here. It was okay for a dial, but it li wouldn't list anything there. So you had to crank with each one. Well, this was a failing of the adding machine, too, but the adding machine didn't need the register because it would have the printing yeah, machine. Yeah, right. So it had an economic advantage there. Plus, it addressed a different market. The, uh, Burroughs captured the banking market, particularly, you know, mm -hmm. because people weren't talking about money. People wanted to receipt for their money, they like to see things going on, and these old big Burroughs machines, you may remember the pictures of them, we ought to have one of those for your part. Right, <laughs> right. With a big thick glass sides on it and so forth, people could see the mechanism going, you know, and then the, the tape would come out and they'd get a copy, you know, that would be just great. So they had that market, but they, they weren't into the, into the back office market. 
But like all good companies, Burroughs around 1912 said, hey, guess what? Felt's patent, original patents on his comptometer just expired. Which is uh, 1887, I think we see here. Yeah, 1887 was the first, uh, first patent dates. Right, so by 1912 or thereabouts, the 17 years had run its course, and uh, Burroughs decided to do their own. And I was, they said, why not, you know? We don't even have to open schools. Phelps got all the trained operators. We'll just make a cheaper, better machine and, you know, undercut them. Great market. They did it. But unaccountably, they made the shape of the box almost identical to this. I don't have any pictures or examples of it because they're very rare for a reason that will become clear. Felt sued them in court immediately because it so happened in his 1904 machine he had patented among other things the shape of the box <laughs> and it was just a dumb thing for Burroughs to do and so immediately they had to draw them all back in so there weren't very many of them around they were pretty rare uh, but from the standpoint of Burroughs as a business they didn't care they redesigned it giving it rounded corners a flatter contour and actually a better machine. A little bit like what Steve Wozniak did with the Apple II, he made, he did what he thought he could do with the Apple I, and then when it was out there and so forth, he started having ideas, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that, and we could do this and we could do that. So the Apple II was a much improved machine. Same thing happened with the Burroughs calculator. They had an opportunity to go back and redo various things. And so they, they sold, they were a competitor, and about the only real competitor that, that Felton Tarrant had, only real direct competitor that Felton Tarrant had. 